everyone. Welcome to BYOB, the Bring Your Own Book podcast. I'm Nikki. I'm Kelly. And I'm Tilly. This week, we're talking about Mexican Gothic by Silvia Moreno-Garcia, which was published in June 2020. Just a heads up that this book contains scenes with graphic body horror. Here's the publisher's synopsis from Tilly. After receiving a frantic letter from her newlywed cousin begging for someone to save her from a mysterious doom... Noemi Taboada heads to High Place, a distant house in the Mexican countryside. She's not sure what she will find. Her cousin's husband, a handsome Englishman, is a stranger, and Noemi knows little about the region. Noemi is also an unlikely rescuer. She's a glamorous debutante, and her chic gowns and perfect red lipstick are more suited for cocktail parties than amateur sleuthing. But she's also tough and smart, with an indomitable will, and she is not afraid. Not of her cousin's new husband, who is both menacing and alluring, not of his father, the ancient patriarch who seems to be fascinated by Noemi, and not even of the house itself, which begins to invade Noemi's dreams with visions of blood and doom. Her only ally in this inhospitable abode is the family's youngest son. Shy and gentle, he seems to want to help Noemi, but he might also be hiding dark knowledge of his family's past. For there are many secrets behind the walls of High Place. The family's once colossal wealth and faded mining empire kept them from prying eyes, but as Noemi digs deeper, she unearths stories of violence and madness. And Noemi, mesmerized by the terrifying yet seductive world of High Place, may soon find it impossible to ever leave this enigmatic house behind. <sighs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> now we're going to hear about what drink we've chosen today from Kelly. The drink we've chosen to pair with this episode is called a Mexico City Mule, which is a spin on a Moscow Mule and is made with tequila, lime juice, and ginger beer. It's a surprising twist on a classic, just like the book had a surprising twist on the classic haunted house tale. I'm so excited to take a sip of this. Are we ready? Yes. We're ready. Mm. Oh, I really like that. You. That ginger beer Yeah, oh. warms you up. I feel like if you had a cold... I mean, I guess you mm-hmm. shouldn't drink really alcohol, clear your sinuses. Like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh my! I feel like this is the type of drink my dad would be like, put some Tabasco in it. <laughs> Whoa, that's such a Seriously. dad thing to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My dad used to put Tabasco in um, Sprite, and he was like, it tastes like ginger ale. <laughs> oh my this god, thing. it's like the what the Frank's Red Hot Sauce. It's like I put that shit, <laughs> shit on, on everything. <laughs> this tastes really good. I like this. I think I'm gonna make more of these actually. I like um, it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Plus, you know, gotta love that copper mug. Yeah. Yes. It's so cute. Yeah, I love it. Check out our Instagram to see the very cute photo of this lovely drink and this great book. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. We're going to move into our star ratings. Like we say in every episode, we rate these books out of five purely because that is what we rated on on Goodreads. We all have different reasons for why we rate things the way that we do, and we will explain that as we go through it. Tilly, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. So I really enjoyed this book. I gave it a four out of five. I loved the titular, or not the titular, but the, the main character, knowing me. I loved the atmospheric writing and the kind of like slow, dreamy pace. I loved that there were like supernatural and magic realism elements. The historical setting was really great. Um, I was surprised by the twists and I found the ending really satisfying. So all in all, I read this book really quickly. I probably took about two days or something. And I just blew right through it. It really transported me. Um, yeah, and that's why I rated it a four out of five. I thought it was great. Awesome. What about you, Kelly? I gave it a three and a half out of five. I was trying to decide between three and a half and a four, and I settled on a three and a half. It took me a bit longer to read, but it wasn't because I wasn't enjoying it. I just found myself wanting to read a couple chapters per sitting, and I liked to like stop and think about, okay, what's happening? What could happen? I kept trying to guess <laughs> what was happening. And oh, yeah. I got one little tiny thing sort of right. But for the most part, I was like, what? What is happening? So once I was like 50% of the way done, I really like powered through, got it done. I really enjoyed it. I thought some scenes were truly horrifying in yeah. many different ways, which, you know, I love, but I also don't love because <laughs> it was a lot to take in. Um 
And I really did enjoy the ending as well. Like, I just thought it was very satisfying, like Tilly said. And Mm -hmm. we'll get into more of why we felt that way when we get to spoilers. Because, wow, this is going to be... There's not a lot you can talk about without spoiling stuff. But I really appreciated how the author, Sylvia Moreno-Garcia, how she set up the book. Because at first I was like, okay, a lot of weird things are happening. But what has happened? But then... Because we had all this setup at the end, I was like, oh my god! And I really felt like I I cared a lot about what happened, and I felt like I was a part of it. So, mm-hmm. three and a half out of five. I really enjoyed it. Awesome. Okay, I gave this book a two out of five. <laughs> what? And <laughs> I'm surprised, because you usually love like a thriller kind of horror book more than I do. Well, my, my big thing... So, I... Like I've said to you guys, I've been really busy. It took me 20 days to read this whole book. And I did the bulk of my reading last Mm -hmm. night because I've been so busy. So I think that that had a huge impact on how I felt about everything. I felt like nothing Mm -hmm. happened in the first half and then too much happened in the second half. And Mm -hmm. this book really, like, have you guys seen the movie A Cure for Wellness? No. no. Well, if anybody is listening and has seen the movie, this book cure for wellness to me and I hated it. It was like I loved that movie until the last 20 minutes when everything was revealed and then I was so mad. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> so, I'll get more into the specifics of why I felt like the book was kind of ruined in spoilers, but I really liked certain aspects of this book, but I felt that it was, I could see where it was trying to go with some of those scenes that were a little more, I guess, extreme, but Mm -hmm. because it, it kind of lives in that realm. Like you don't know if it's YA and you don't know if it's adult. It wasn't like enough of either thing for me like I wish that it would have just been a little bit like more enhanced in those aspects or Mm. they would have just not tried to do some of those like body horror things that were happening because I was just kind of like all right that's that's fine I was a little indifferent towards Mm. those scenes but I did enjoy um the setup and I loved all of the like atmosphere around the house Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the cemetery and the town. I really loved all that. And I loved everything that was focusing around um, Catalina and Mm -hmm. her comatose behavior, all of her like switching back and forth between um, wanting to leave and wanting to stay and all that kind of stuff. I really enjoyed those aspects of the book. I was surprised when you said I wasn't sure where it fell between YA and adult, because to me, I was like, this is not YA. But then I understand what you mean, because sometimes the tone or like some of the some of how how do I say this? (laughs) Some of the ways that some things happened, I could understand how maybe that could be read as YA. You know what I mean? I found the ending was very like, it was very confusing, at least listening to the audiobook. I was really confused about how she was coming to some of these conclusions Mm -hmm. because it seemed like they, they gave her like two pieces of information and then she somehow created like 1 million other pieces of like factual information from thin air And that really bothers me in a book, Mm -hmm. especially like this, because it's not something that you see a lot in books where you could be like, oh, yeah, everybody knows that. Right. (laughs) Because nobody knows that. (laughs) Yeah, I know what you mean. There were a few kind of leaps of uh, uh, leaping to conclusions that weren't necessarily like set up. But it didn't really bother me, I think, because it was a surprise. Mm -hmm. So it it made me not able to guess the ending of it all. But I did have a moment of like, wait a minute, how did she she get this? How is she realizing that? Hold on a second. (laughs) Noemi, are you psychic? (laughs) She's an anthropologist student, okay? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) 
She's also smart. Amateur psychic. Yes. <laughs> She's a smart cookie. Yeah. I was just going to say that I loved whenever she went into town, and I wish that there was more in the town because oh. I wanted to. Oh, really? <laughs> you didn't feel the same? I didn't care about the town. I was like, I'm all about the house. I want to know what's going on here. I liked the town because I wanted to spend more time with the healer. I wanted to hear more mm. backstory because when she did tell us some info, I was like, ooh, you know, I was very excited to hear about that. Um, and I just find places like that very interesting because they're almost forgotten and living in the past. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think if there could have been a way to have a bit more of that without sacrificing the overall point and plot of the of the mm -hmm. book then i would have loved that but yeah but i understand that yeah it's like let's go back to high place because i mean yeah <laughs> yeah and i think the reason i i felt that my immediate reaction was like no i didn't care about the town was because everything that happened in the town was just people telling her things mm -hmm. like knowing you would go to the town and people would explain things about high place so things happened in high place and then things were explained in el triunfo in the town mm-hmm yeah. So it felt to me like the action was all kind of taking place in the manner. Yeah. Um, but I can see what you mean. And it is an interesting concept, this like kind of rural um, village in the Mexican countryside that's like kind of small and everything's a little bit old and there's like dust. You can see like um, in my head, I was picturing, what are they called? Uh, tumbleweeds. The dusty tumbleweeds. <laughs> yeah. Tumbleweeds going by. <laughs> well, but I, when she does go into town, though, she has a bit more freedom, even though it's, like, stealthy freedom. So I think that's why I was like, go to town. Let's see what can happen there. Like, maybe you can meet people who can help you or blah, blah, blah. I don't know. But because when she's in high place, Florence, freaking Florence, I... Oh, yeah. Wow. She sucked. We'll get into her later, I'm sure. Never met a good uh, Florence. <laughs> <laughs> oh, true. I haven't Except met maybe a Florence. Florence in the machine isn't... Have you isn't met her? her? Oh, She's a musician? No. Is she yeah. banned? I don't know. <laughs> Oh, Florence Welch. I have not met her. No, me either. <laughs> me neither. I'm sure. Maybe she's lovely. Has anyone met her? Let us know. <laughs> Call in. Yeah. Call in. We don't have a phone. A I know, Kelly. Show. That's the joke. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, what I really loved about knowing me is that she was a 22-year-old socialite who was just, like, flighty and kind of, like, interested in parties. But at the very beginning, her father trusts her with this, like, important mission. And he just tells her, like, you're stubborn. You don't stick to things. Why don't you put your stubbornness to good use and go check up on your cousin and be there for the family and, like, take care of this issue? And knowing me takes it so seriously. And she becomes, like, uber-focused. I thought she was a really compelling female character who kind of like didn't have to choose between being like fashionable and pretty and smart and witty mm -hmm. and also being like a sleuth who could like be there for her family and be loyal and get things done but I didn't that was awesome. she just do it so that he'd pay for her masters i think there was definitely an element of that because she says um, she's like true. if i leave now i don't get to do my masters <laughs> so but but that's a that's good true. cause, right? And not like, but I want a car, right? <laughs> no, I know. But I'm just saying, like, it's, I don't think it was all about family loyalty. I'm true. just saying it was, I think, mostly a selfish reason. That happened pretty late in the book, and she was still thinking that, so. Yeah. But, <laughs> I mean. Although, I think once she got to the house, like, I think it might have started out as a selfish reason, and then I think when she got to the house, she didn't talk very much about her degree anymore. It was all about, like, Catalina, I have to help Catalina, mm -hmm. I have to get her out of here. So um, I think there's it's possible that there was, like, some growth on her end, but I, I take your point for sure. Yeah, I really liked her, but I also did think throughout the book, <laughs> at certain times, I was like, wow, she is rude. But she is not the worst <laughs> Love offender. Love a rude female character. Yeah. But I liked that, though, because she's yeah. not perfect. But because she's not perfect, even though she's raised a certain way and she's supposed to be, you know, well-dressed and put together and, you know, she knows all the social cues and everything, she also doesn't take shit. Like, she doesn't yeah. let them walk all over her. She definitely needs help uh, from other people at times, right? And she's not, like, <laughs> she's not, I wouldn't say she's, like, the picture of who I would want to be, you know, but, like... There are times in the book where I'm like, good for you. Like, I highlighted so many moments where I was like, wow, that was rude. And then also, oh, my God, I can't believe she said that. But I'm glad she did, you know? 
So, hey, I liked her. <laughs> I would be scared to hang out with her, though. I think. <laughs> I think she would. I would be like, oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> no, I want to hang out with her. She's powerful. <laughs> she yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. What did you guys think about Francis? <sighs> oh, I liked him. I kept wanting him to not be evil. Same. Because um, it's like he's the only person in this family who is like even friendly or kind of like open in any way. And at first I, I was like, oh, he's boring. But then the more that knowing me start to uh, like get to know him and understand why he is like shy and soft spoken. And he just wants to like study biology and like draw pictures of mushrooms. And he really uh, captured my heart <laughs> in those moments. Are we going into spoilers or does it matter? It's Francis. <laughs> yeah, he just likes to draw pictures. Okay, great. I, I don't know. I was just worried for a sec. <laughs> okay. If that's a spoiler, we can cut it out. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I, don't I liked know. him. I liked him too, but I, I was constantly worried. Uh, not for... Well, yeah, I was worried for him and about him. Mm. I, I couldn't yeah, trust anyone in this book. And he also seemed too pure. Like, it was like, uh-oh, I hope he doesn't get murdered for being the nice one. You know what I mean? Oh, mm-hmm. Yeah. I was worried about that. I was not. But I think my opinion... You didn't like him? My, I, no, I think that just what what I feel about Francis is spoilery. Oh, okay. Because okay. it'll, it'll kind of give away the end of the book. Um, yeah. But yeah. Yeah, I... Uh, I have lots of feelings about a lot of these characters that yeah. we should get into after. Yes. Um, do you guys like the pacing of the book? I know I kind of said that I thought that the first half was like really slow and nothing happened. And then there was like too much happening in the second half. But what did you guys think? I definitely understand where you're coming from with that. I think because I read it so fast, it didn't click for me in that right. same way. But I, I do remember thinking like, wow, a lot of this is unfolding in the last 50 pages and I have to take a lot of this in and uh, it's, it's kind of difficult to keep up with. But I, I liked how it was paced in the beginning where it was very like atmospheric and setting everything up and the tension was very slowly building. And then it was like 100% all the time for the last 50 pages. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was slow at the beginning, but not necessarily a bad slow. However, I did think to myself, like, I wish that she had peppered in some of these moments or discoveries, like, a little earlier. Mm -hmm. Just so, like, you can still build atmosphere, but have something happen, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I think that my main thing with the pacing, I don't know how to say this. My main problem with the pacing actually came to me after I finished the book. Because if this would have been a haunted house paranormal story just on its own, it wouldn't have bothered me that that was what the pacing was like. But because you got this huge twist and there was all of this other stuff dumped on you, I felt like it that should have happened a lot earlier. Because mm. I... And maybe that's because I didn't think the twist was good, but, (laughs) but yeah, so I think, I don't know if that's just because I didn't like what the twist was, but I think that it could have been like 70 pages of that instead of 150 pages of that before anything happened. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, Makes sense. I see that, yeah. Because, yeah, at the beginning, it was a lot of like, oh, these people are strange. Oh, they're rude. Let me go to my room for the night. I'm like, what? But also, does anyone know the timeline of this book? Because I was like, how many days has she been there? And they would be like, come back in a week. Come back at this time. Like when she'd go into town. And I'm like, how long was she here for? What do you mean come back in a week? Think, Two weeks? What? Yeah, I think... She was probably there for about a month, all told. <gasps> oh, God. Was probably, I don't know, that's just what made sense to me. Like, definitely okay. a few weeks. And the time did kind of slip away. And I, I kind of liked that because I thought it felt it fit in with her mm. whole narrative of, like, I don't know how much time goes by because it's so dark in the manor all the time. And, like, I don't have any connections to the outside world. And I'm so, so closed right. in. And it all felt like kind of a creepy nightmare. I was so right. confused because I'm picturing her with, like, one suitcase, like, sound of music. You know? Like, I'm going on a yeah. trip to visit my cousin. But actually, I've been here for months. <laughs> you know, like, one suitcase. 
yeah, I mean, there were a lot of times that it felt like kind of limbo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's weird because so much time passes to feel like nothing happened Mm -hmm. until the end. Mm -hmm. And I guess you could argue that that's like a really good plot device to use but (laughs) you sound so convinced but you're like i guess you could say that if you were dumb (laughs) you have to get the readers to stick around that long though that's the thing well that's my issue i was like Mm -hmm. i feel like it it could have started off it's like when we all read Addie larue and it's like well she's been alive for 300 years and it's like well i don't want to fucking live for 300 years that's kind of what it ended up i want to read this for 300 years yeah (laughs) 17 hours. It was much shorter than Addie LaRue, though. Yes, Yes. thank God. (laughs) Do you want to get into book recommendations? Yes, let's recommend some books. Um, Okay, so I'll start then. Um, My first recommendation is a classic, Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. Yes, I thought of Um, that. Yeah, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it was even referenced in Mexican Gothic as kind of a, a meta, like, obvious reference because it is, of course, a classic Gothic novel, which is also set in this spooky house full of family secrets. And we follow a young female protagonist who's like slowly unfolding the mysteries around her and on the moors and the mist and all that. So it made total sense to me. It's one of my favorite books of all time. I read it when I was, I think, in high school and it like really had a big impact on me. So that might be partly why I'm so into this book, Mexican Gothic, because it reminded me it had so many callbacks to like the the tradition of classic gothic literature which i'm super into oh nice what about you kelly this book reminded me of mexican gothic a little bit not because of the plot but because of similar um thematic tonal kind of Mm -hmm. similarities um and that would be sharp objects by jillian flynn i Mm. loved that book i read it in one sitting on the train from ottawa to toronto (laughs) it was great yeah Um, And it deals with a woman going back to her small hometown and she's living with her mother and her uh, sister and, or sorry, her half sister who she doesn't really know a lot and, or doesn't know very well, I should say. (laughs) And it was just very creepy and you were left feeling like, what is going on with this family dynamic? Who's controlling who? Very, uh just creepy so that's why it reminded me of that book i would not say it's a horror book it's definitely like a thriller psychological thriller um but yeah i that would be my suggestion because i did think of jane Eyre, but i had never read it so i was like i should not recommend you gotta read it it's so good i love it i I loved the movie so i really want to read the book because wow like i don't know if there's probably been multiple movies made but i'm talking about the one with michael fassbender (laughs) That was like, oh, yeah. hello. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, he's too hot to play Rochester, though. Rochester's not supposed to be that handsome. Oh. That was my only gripe. Yeah. But <laughs> Didn't some weird well, stuff come out about him, though? So I guess it would work, because... But Michael Fassbender? Yeah. Not that I know of. That oh. his dick is huge. Mm, yeah, we know that. No, that's not what I was going to say. <laughs> oh. Never mind. I don't want to be sued for libel, so <laughs> I'll just keep my mouth shut. It's very possible. I mean, lots of people have done dumb, yeah. bad shit. Yeah. So. Anyways, that would be my recommendation. <laughs> I probably didn't word it very well, but it's a really good book. It's very creepy. Psychological puzzling thriller. Loved it. Yeah. Hi. Tilly, what's your second one? Um, My second one would be, okay, this is a collection of stories by Angela Carter called The Bloody Chamber and Other Stories. Nice. So Angela Carter is a British novelist and short storyteller, and this is a collection of dark retellings of fairy tales, which also includes like a lot of body horror, and it's just like steeped in the romantic gothic tradition, and it reminded me a lot of like and Noemi talks a lot in Mexican Gothic about how Catalina's obsessed with fairy tales. Mm. And it just really made me think that Catalina would have read this collection of stories, Bloody Chamber. So. Ooh, I like that. I love mm-hmm. it. Okay, my recommendation is similar in, I would say, theme, possibly, partial plot. Um, It's Duma Key by Stephen King. So this is a thick bitch of a book. Huge book. 
but it was it's so good. Um, so basically, it follows this man named Ed Edgar or Edward Fremantle, and he has a workplace accident in which he loses his arm and sustains um, head injuries. And then he goes to this place called Duma Key, and he rents or buys this kind of beach house, and he starts to paint. And the whole book takes place in this weird house where all of these kind of crazy paranormal-esque things are happening. He has this crazy old lady neighbor and her son or caretaker, and they're helping him get through this, um, his recovery, essentially. And there's something happening with his paintings, um, one thing I forgot to mention is that I realized when I was reading this book that I haven't actually read a lot of works that are set in Central or South America, so I would have liked to have more uh, representation in the diversity of the authors, but my recommendations are all pretty just similar in tone and theme rather than in like setting. Mm, right. Um, but it made me excited to read more um, more books by Central or South American authors. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So... My third recommendation is The Seven Deaths of Evelyn Hardcastle by Stuart Turton. So good. Which is a fast-paced supernatural thriller with the protagonist waking up in different bodies each day and trying to figure out the murder of the title character. So definitely a similar build in tension and a surprising finish. And it just reminded me a lot of um, the feeling that I got while reading that book was a similar feeling with Mexican Gothic. Like kind of like, oh my God, what's happening? I don't know what's happening. (laughs) Yeah, so oh my god, the my twist at the end of that book was really good. I was like, what? It's really good. I haven't read I felt, that one. I felt cheated, but in a good way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, that's great. Yeah, I really agree with you, Tilly, on... Um, I haven't read a lot of books by Central or South American authors or anything like that either, but one of my favorite parts of this book was the setting mm-hmm. and... Yeah. Hearing, a, even though it happens with a family that's English, which is mm-hmm. not what I was expecting, but also probably more than just what it seems to be. Um, mm-hmm. And so that was that was fine. But I would have definitely liked to hear more about Mexico City or her life there before she came to High Place. And more, like, atmospheric kind of narrative passages about what the mm-hmm. town was like and all of that kind of stuff, because I was really interested in that. It's something I don't know anything about. I've never been to Mexico or anything. I was kind of – I've I've never been to Cuba, but I was picturing it like what Cuba looks like now, because they're <coughs> kind of stuck way in the – way in the in the past – in the Mm. 50s Mm. and stuff with like what their cars look like and everything so that's like the closest thing i had to picture what this place could have looked like Mm. and i loved that about it i actually lived in central america for about six years and i was in central america until i was three Uh, i don't remember Mm. anything i see pictures Um, so I was just imagining a lot of what I remember seeing, like, in family photo albums, um, because we were living in, I don't, my mom's gonna listen to this and be like, Kelly, don't you remember you lived here? No, I don't remember. Um, (laughs) um, they lived in, yeah, (laughs) they lived in Costa Rica and Honduras when I, like, during that time, so, and they were in very, you know, impoverished areas, so... You know, similar kind of feel of, like, smaller villages. Um, They did not live in the city. So I was just picturing a lot of what I saw in the photos. But, yeah, I would have Mm -hmm. loved to have gotten more of that. And I did notice, I mean, it's not really a shock, but we can do better going forward. Um, We read a lot of white authors, right? So it would be good for next Mm -hmm. season to try to, you know, do less white authors (laughs) and get stories from different... Absolutely different uh geographical locations different backgrounds and yeah because yeah i really enjoyed this story and i would have loved more about her life in mexico city or the town in el trianfo yeah. so yeah mm-hmm. 
Yeah. I did read too that there's um, going to be a TV miniseries adaptation of this book. Nice. Um, which I think would be really, mm. really beautiful with all the kind of like historical details and the creepy atmosphere is so visual. I really think it would be like so much cinematic tension could be built up. So I'd be really excited to see that. Cool. Yeah. I think that would be really, really nice. Okay, we're going to move on to spoilers now because I feel like almost everything that we said in the non-spoiler part was like just on the cusp <laughs> of being a total spoiler <laughs> for the book. <laughs> okay, so we're going to start off with a little synopsis so that we can all be on the same page. Mm-hmm. So as we know from the publisher's summary, the story follows Noemi Taboada, a young socialite living in Mexico City in the 1950s. At the start of the book, Noemi is leaving a party early, called home by her father after receiving a troubling letter from her cousin Catalina. Noemi and Catalina were always close growing up, but this is one of the first times the family has heard from her since she married the handsome Englishman Virgil Doyle a year ago and moved to his family manor in rural village. While the Doyle family made their money running the silver mine near their house, the mine has been closed for years and their wealth has dried up. Catalina's letter is rambling and difficult to understand, claiming that Virgil is poisoning her and that she is seeing ghosts in high place, the Doyle family manor. Noemi's father has been in touch with Virgil, who claims that Catalina is sick and is being treated by their family doctor. Noemi's father does not trust Virgil after their quick courtship and marriage, and he charges Noemi with the task of going to visit High Place and check up on her cousin. Once Noemi arrives in El Trinfo, the village closest to High Place, she is met at the train by Francis Doyle, Virgil's cousin. He is a shy and soft-spoken man, and as he drives her to High Place, Francis explains that the manor is owned by Virgil's father, Howard Doyle, and that both Francis and his mother Florence live there as well as Virgil and Catalina. At the house, Noemi meets Virgil, a cold and intimidating man, and his cousin Florence, who is strict in her role of maintaining High Place. Noemi wants to see Catalina, but she is heavily medicated and says that she has tuberculosis and a fever. Noemi is suspicious, but Catalina is whisked off by Florence for her medication before she can say anything more. Noemi sits through an awkward family dinner and meets the elderly patriarch Howard Doyle, who seems obsessed with eugenics and both admires Noemi's beauty and implies that she is inferior because of her indigenous heritage. Though she is disgusted with the leering old man, Noemi is determined to get help for her cousin and suggests that she see a psychiatrist. Virgil explains that the family doctor, Arthur Cummins, is treating Catalina, and that Florence administers her medicine. None of the Doyles seem to think that anything is out of the ordinary with Catalina. In a rare moment alone with her cousin, Catalina asks Noemi to pick up a batch of medicine from a local woman in town named Marta Duvall. Catalina begs her to keep it secret from the Doyles, claiming that they can hear her because there are ghosts in the walls. Dr. Cummins arrives before she can say more and assures Noemi that Catalina's illness is nothing to worry about. Noemi insists on getting a second opinion, and Virgil reluctantly agrees. That night, Noemi becomes fixated on the green wallpaper in her room and has strange dreams of flowers sprouting from it and a golden woman with no face who is trying to speak to her. Noemi goes into town the next day and speaks to the doctor in town, Dr. Camarillo, who has not heard of any cases of tuberculosis in the area. But he tells Noemi of a strange epidemic that used to pop up at the Doyle's mine every so often, causing fevers and ranting and raving. Noemi also visits Marta Duval and asks for Catalina's medicine. Marta tells Noemi that the Doyle family is cursed and that years ago, Howard's daughter Ruth shot several family members the day before her arranged wedding to her cousin. Marta claimed there was more proof of the curse in the death of Francis's father, Florence's husband, Richard, who started ranting and raving about ghosts and was found dead in the bottom of a ravine. Marta promises to make the medicine for Catalina and tells Noemi to come back in a week. A whole lot of other wild stuff happens, including Virgil's predatory advances on Noemi, more truths uncovered about Ruth Doyle and the shooting so many years ago, the growing feelings between Noemi and Francis, more nightmares about things in the walls of High Place, Catalina's near-fatal seizure after receiving Marta's medicine, whispers of Howard's illness and imminent death, and Noemi's increasing fears and suspicions about the Doyle family and the creepy, damp manner they live in. 
Finally, Noemi decides to leave High Place and find a psychiatrist for Catalina. Though Virgil agrees to take her to town in the morning, he first brings her to see Howard, who is now bedridden. Noemi is repulsed by the sight of him as one of his legs is horrifically bloated and covered with black boils. Virgil forces Noemi closer, and though she struggles, Howard kisses her and puts his tongue down her throat, depositing some sort of disgusting black liquid. Cute. Noemi faints and has a vision of a young Howard Doyle and finds out the truth of the Doyle family curse, a mushroom that Howard discovered hundreds of years ago that could extend life and cure diseases. When she awakes, disoriented, Francis is there and explains that the fungus grows in and around High Place and creates symbiotic relationships with its hosts. The dreams and visions that Noemi and Catalina have been experiencing are part of something called the Gloom, a repository of memories from the fungus connected to the house. And the Doyle blood is special, as the fungus is especially potent with them and can make them immortal. Francis explains that Howard has lived many lives in different bodies, and the time of this body is coming to an end. Now Howard wants Noemi to be part of the family and won't allow her to leave. That's what happened to Francis's father. He wanted to leave, and the gloom drove him mad. Francis wants to help Noemi and Catalina, but they don't have much time. Francis tells Noemi to pretend to go along with their plans for now, and Virgil and Florence arrange a quick wedding between Francis and Noemi, hoping to branch out of their incestuous marriages and replenish their wealth. After the ceremony, Noemi is ambushed by Virgil, who tries to assault her, but she shoves him and knocks him out. Noemi runs to find Catalina, but she is unresponsive. Florence then comes in with a gun and tells them that the transmutation of Howard's mind into Francis's body is happening now. Just as all hope seems lost, Catalina comes to and stabs Howard in the eye as he attempts to transmutate, causing all the Doyles nearby to spasm and fall, including Francis. Noemi, Catalina, and Francis run to escape through a passageway in the crypt when Virgil shows up and fights Francis. Noemi sees the body of a woman there, sprouting golden mushrooms on all sides, the golden woman from her nightmares and realizes it is Howard's first wife, Agnes, who is sacrificed to be the mind and hub of the fungus. Noemi lights the body on fire, and while the Doyle men are incapacitated, Catalina also stabs Virgil in the eye. <laughs> Get a girl. Love it. Fuck yeah. <laughs> Catalina and Noemi carry Francis out of the crypt and escape the grounds, with High Place ablaze behind them. A few days later, they are all at Dr. Camarillo's in El Truinfo, recovering after taking Marta's tincture. Catalina and Noemi seem fine, but Francis fell into a deep sleep and they were unsure if he would wake. The book ends with Francis waking up to Noemi, and while they both fear the fungus may still have a hold on them, they vow to be together and try to remake the world into a better place. <sighs> Uh, <laughs> a happy so ending. Cute. I really wasn't sure there for a while. Yeah, I, was... I really wanted him to be evil. I was scared about Why? that. Well, I was just like, okay, like I'm waiting for the the turn. He, it was mm. such a good setup for him to be like disgusting. But wasn't it cool that it subverted your expectations so that it would be a happy ending and that everything was okay? I like that because like, I'm no. like always rooting for love. <laughs> I just like that they they stopped the cycle, you know, because yeah. his family is fucked. Like, oh my god. Yeah. So where do we yeah. start? <laughs> oh my god, there's so many I places mean... we could start. Okay, when <laughs> I'm just going to put this out there do you guys know who bill skarsgård is yes yeah that's just like who i was picturing as virgil which made it really hard for me to hate all the shitty oh. things he was doing because i'm in love with bill oh okay but no. if he tried to has... rape someone like virgil <laughs> yeah he was bad on all yeah. fronts he, um... but i understand if you like loved the the actor and yeah you're picturing yeah well because he was like at the beginning, you think he's just, like, maybe not a super great guy, but not, like, terrifying, you know? Right. And there's this shitty Netflix show called Hemlock Grove that Bill is in, and he has the same kind of vibe that Virgil has mm -hmm. at the beginning of the book. And so then I had that image in my head, and I mm -hmm. couldn't get it out. 
it didn't matter what happened in the book. It was just like that image. And also I just love not bad characters. I love very well-written characters who are bad. Mm Mm-hmm. It's like my MO. Okay. <laughs> I just realized that when you said Bill Skarsgård, I was picturing the older one, Stella Skarsgård. Oh, Stella Skarsgård. Skarsgård. And I was like, wait a minute. Bill that Skarsgård can't be the one played with. Pennywise and it. That's, yeah, I'm there now. <laughs> There's also another one, right? There's Alexander yes, Skarsgård. I'm an yeah, Alexander brother. fan. <laughs> he played Tarzan. He's also very attractive. He played Tarzan? Mm-hmm. Oh my God. I just, I remember yeah. him from Big Little Lies and True Blood. But oh yeah, I didn't oh, watch a so lot of good. True Blood. But Big Little Lies, I was like, "Wow, you are a complete asshole." But I know why she was tricked because you're very smooth and handsome. So, wow, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, this is not about. I mean, them. that happens all the time. Yes. Um. So one of the things that really excited me about this book is that it, I think I mentioned earlier it like transported me and. Uh, it transported me not to like a place, but like a time in my life when Ooh. I was reading a lot of Gothic literature. And I think it was, I was trying to nail it down in my head. I think it was specifically a class I was taking in university. So I have a degree in English literature and this class was about specifically women's writing and specifically like older women, women's writing that wasn't included in the like traditional um, literature canon because women's writing wasn't ever tracked. It wasn't like appreciated. It wasn't valued. And so many of the texts that we read in that class were kind of gothic in nature. And I think it, it, it has to do with like the this commentary on um, women kind of exploring like the isolation, the helplessness that they felt in the times of writing it. And so this book like really kind of made all those things um, come back up for me. And I got like really excited <laughs> writing this outline of this episode and just like thinking about it and thinking about all the ways that this book fits into that same kind of commentary of like the helpless woman who like raises up and like defeats everyone who's being awful. And I don't know, I just, I just had a really great time reading it and I'm just excited to talk about it. Yeah. I have super conflicting feelings because even Mm -hmm. though I rated this book, not like it obviously could have been lower, Mm -hmm. but I didn't rate it like super highly There were a lot of things with the atmosphere and those specific qualities that I really liked. And Mm -hmm. all of my issues were Mm -hmm. plot-based. I was really hoping that this was going to turn into um, more of like a standard paranormal story Mm. or have some kind of like really ingenious real explanation for all of the stuff that was going on. So you don't think the fungus is real? I don't know. I don't think... Well, I mean, mold can do weird shit to you, but I don't think it can make you live for 300 years. That's where... I mean, we never know. That's where it got, like, stupid to me. (laughs) I think... So, I said before, this book, Cure for wellness to me... And basically, in that movie, we have this young man, and he is going to find his boss that has decided he's gone on this retreat to find the cure for wellness, and he has not come back. And they keep getting letters from him, but they're not really sure when he's going to come back to work, and his bosses send him to find, to, to bring the guy home, essentially. And all of this weird stuff happens. It's like this retreat in the mountains. Everybody's super weird. It's super atmospheric. It's such a good movie. And then at the end, you find out that they're harvesting their blood for this 300-year-old like vampire. And it's like the Phantom of the Opera meets horror meets immor- immortality. And that's exactly what this book reminded me of at the end. And I was like, what a cop out. <laughs> Oh, interesting. I was so glad that there were no vampires because I was scared for a sec Me too. that I was going to go there. And I was like, <sighs> oh, yeah. Like, that's there's no way, you know? I liked that it was mushroom and fungus because it's almost like pseudoscientific in a way. Like, mm. there's all sorts of weird stuff that, that flora and fauna can do, especially like mushrooms and mycelium and all mm-hmm. that stuff. And there is this un- unexplored territory of like plants having living memories yes and being kind of interconnected so even though it was a little fantastical it was still close enough that i was like i could see it like this could be a thing that no one's discovered yet yeah i mean i immediately thought of um a work that i just 
helped produce with my theater company, right? McKenna James Beckner's A Real Boy or The Pinocchio Project. There's a lot of mushrooms and, you know, natural, uh, I don't know if you would call it like um, magical realism or what you would call Mm -hmm. it, but very similar things in tone in terms of the mushrooms and the fungi and how they have powers and can be menacing and stuff. It, it that's what I thought of like right away as soon as they brought up mushrooms. I was like, oh my God, oh my God, I gotta tell McKenna to read this. They're gonna love it, you know? <laughs> but yeah. I do think mushrooms are very interesting. And I would love to know, maybe, maybe if I looked it up, maybe she would have an interview somewhere. But I wonder what inspired her to write this book and why mold? Why mushrooms? You know, like what was it about that? That she was like, I like this. I'm going to explore it. Because, I mean, I've got mold in my bathroom. And now I'm like, oh, God. Like, <laughs> i got to get rid of this. i got to get rid of it. I'm going to start going. You know, yeah, I'm going to start, like, hearing things and going into people's memories. And, oh, God. So, <laughs> I don't know. You're going to live to be 300 years old? If I have, have to, like, nasty eat your children or boils? something? Yeah. Ew. There were so many gross things that I just highlighted on my Kobo and put, ew. Yeah, there was a lot of gross stuff. I loved it. It was I, so gross. I liked, I liked it. Like I said, I wish it would have gone further with some of it. Um, I... I mean, I read a lot of horror, so the body mm-hmm. horror in this didn't particularly make me feel horrified, mm-hmm. but I I appreciated what she was trying to do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I enjoyed that aspect. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, strangely, I don't really get bothered by body horror. I'm more in- I don't like being scared. <laughs> And I don't like when there's, like, the uncanny valley of, you know, like, possessed children or something. I can't handle that. Oh, yeah. But when it's got to do with, like, gross... Yeah, they're absolutely scary. But when it's got to do with, like, gross body stuff, I am actually, like, kind of interested in it. And I think it's because, um, again, like, back in university, I read a lot of books that were written by women who focused on the body as kind of, like, a gross thing or, like, kind of um, reveling in the disgustingness of, like women's bodies being imperfect and so i think there's a lot of interesting territory there of um like what makes body horror is it just like something that's unusual is it something that's wrong with them is it something that like is just what society perceives to be wrong like is body hair body horror i don't know (laughs) so i'm just like very interested in this idea yeah yeah the parts that scared me the most because while I didn't enjoy the scene where she had to kiss Howard and his nasty yeah, black ooze, whatever, yeah. not ooze, I guess that's a, that's not a thing. It's a, it's a uh, verb. Um, <laughs> the stuff that was coming out of him, that sounded disgusting. Yeah. Um, but the parts that really, really freaked me out and made me like, Ugh, was when she was dreaming, but not dreaming. And Virgil was oh, yeah. like sexually assaulting oh, her. Yeah. Not into yeah, that. No. no, that was like bad. horrifying. Bad. Like, oh, he was so sinister. And like, it was written well, but I was like, oh my God. Like, trigger warnings, people, because whoa. Like, it was. Yeah, I was like, wow, this is this is quite horrifying. And it works for the book. Yeah. You know, I will say it does work with the book. It's not like she just threw it in there to be obscene like it works with what's happening it was just so nasty in every way and i thought she did it well but yeah it was that's what scared me the most were those scenes of like you don't have control of your own body i control you what are you going to do about it that's terrifying Mm, yeah that's scary (laughs) yeah that was those were my favorite passages to read Mm -hmm. yeah i thought that they were just really well written I could feel everything that she was feeling and she described really well. I felt like that pull of being like, I am drawn to this, but Mm -hmm. at the same time, it fucking repulses me and he Mm -hmm. repulses me. Mm -hmm. You, I don't know, maybe you guys haven't, but I have dreams where like one part of me is like thinking one thing and the other part of me is thinking something completely different. 
So oh, yeah, I think just, like, everybody these invasive thoughts. Yeah, so I think everybody can r- read that and take at least a little bit of what she's feeling and understand that. Mm-hmm. And it made the scenes where like when she wakes up and she's in his room and mm-hmm. he's like telling her to sit down and have a drink and they're kind of discussing the lamp or whatever. Mm-hmm. Oh, well like if you if I wasn't being nice to you, you couldn't have the lamp and you couldn't go back to your room and you'd have to stay here longer and all that stuff. I was just so intrigued by Mm. Virgil and trying to really get to the bottom of what his motives were. Cause you really feel like he is Mm -hmm. the one that's going to take over Howard's body and then at the end, doesn't right. it turn out to be Francis who's going to take over his body? And I was like, <sighs> yeah, I yeah. was like, oh, that's so interesting. Mm-hmm. But it makes so much more sense mm-hmm. because you could really see why Virgil was trying so hard. Because why would he care if he was going to take over Howard's body and rule everything anyway? Mm-hmm. Then it would none of that, none of his game plan would really make sense. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to add on, which is that there there are just so many moments of, like, not knowing what's real or what's in her head. And, of course, being set in the 50s, too, there's so much shame about sexuality. And Noemi specifically talks about how she's, you know, like, had intimate moments with men in her life, but she hasn't um, been sexual with a man before. And so she has this, um, she's drawn to Virgil because he's very... Uh, charismatic and kind of almost has like animalistic sex appeal to him and so she's drawn to him but doesn't want to be because he's her cousin's husband and he's kind of evil and she has all this shame because he's making her feel ashamed about her body yeah there's a lot of interesting stuff going on there i have a quote that's directly related to that that i would like to read yeah (laughs) because i I highlighted so many things in this because i just was like wow or oh i gotta remember that because i was trying to piece it together (laughs) i didn't get it but (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this quote is lined up right with what we're talking about. This is when uh, he tries to rape her near the end after she marries Francis in their little weird culty, not even a cult, but their ritual. Okay. It's not like a legal marriage. Um, after she marries Francis, Virgil says to Noemi, life bores you, Noemi. You like a hint of danger, but but back home they wrap you in gauze to keep you from breaking. But you'd like to break, wouldn't you? You play with people, and you wish someone would have the guts to play with you. And I'm just like, ugh. I, <laughs> I appreciate that quote. However, <laughs> it's so twisted, and it makes a lot of sense, and I think that's just a one clue of a very, very talented writer, because... You know, he's he's he is basically saying what we're saying, right? Like she has a little bit of experience, but because of where she comes from, she's kind of like in a different world. And at the very beginning, she's hanging out with Hugo Duarte and she's mm-hmm. like, oh, he's cute, but I'm not going to like do anything with him. Like he's just fun to go on dates with whatever. Um, but she wants more and she wants to. She wants to meet someone. She wants to... She's like, I'm interested in doing things, but there's no one I've really found yet. And she she's, she says something at the beginning, like, she knows Hugo, like, won't ever try anything with her. And he's just, like, happy mm. to be out with her because, like, she's a prize. Mm-hmm. So he's like, I see you for what you are, and I'm going to play with you, and I'm going to... Whatever, I'm not going to treat you like you're on a pedestal. And it's like, okay, but I don't want you, so you don't get to, you know? So I just found that part, like, struck a chord because I was like, wow. Like, she, the writer really went into the mind of this psycho really well, I thought. Um, there were a lot of parts in here that I was like, oh, my God, you know, like, just awful. But when you look at this as a, a piece of work, right? Like, it's really well done, I thought. But it's just like, oh, my God, some of these ideas and... The the characters are awful. <laughs> they're so awful. They're sexist. They're racist. It. Oh my god! Like all the. Well, it's the fifties for you. Yeah, but I mean, uh, earlier Nikki, you mentioned about how you were kind of surprised that the book was about uh, English people, like a family of Englishmen. 
Um, and it makes sense, though, because of what happens in the book with all the talks of eugenics and, you know, there being a superior people and just disgusting. But I was like, wow, it makes, yeah, it just makes sense with this story. And I think that's why I liked the end so much, because Francis could have just, you know, done his part, but he didn't want to be a part of that. And his dad, Howard, says we're all born into what we're supposed to be. And Francis doesn't want to be that. And Noemi is like, you don't have to, you know, let's go. Let's leave. Let's, <laughs> let's yeah, start I mean, She saves him in the end because yeah. I don't think he ever would have left if she hadn't shown up. No. But he, she gave him, like, a reason to leave. Mm -hmm. And it was just so yeah. satisfying to see at the end, see everyone, like, lit on fire. Yes. Literally. I loved it. I kept yeah. thinking, Stabbed just in the eyeball. put your cigarette on the drapes or whatever. Like, just light it up, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I think it was also really interesting. Like he, like he had no intention of leaving even up until like the very end. Francis, yeah, yeah he was just like, okay, we'll just go. And mm -hmm. she's like, no, you're gonna come with me. And then he started to get sick, and he's like, just go. And she's like, no, you have yeah. to come with me. And <laughs> he's like passed out, and she's like literally dragging him off the property. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I. I did really like that. While I did really wish that um, Francis would have been evil, because <laughs> I think it would have been a really fun plot device, <laughs> I do like that it ends happily for them, <laughs> even though I, I wish that it wouldn't have... I guess they don't really specify at the end. She says what she kisses him three times or something and the last one is with love or for love or whatever i kind of wish that they would have just been like really good friends or something mm -hmm. i don't know if i was in that situation i don't think i would become sexually attracted to somebody just because i'm in that situation also that family. i don't know like, that <laughs> trauma brings people together when That's you go true. through a difficult yeah traumatic event like i that. just i am tired of that trope i yeah. guess is what mm -hmm. i mean to say because every book that's like that seems to end with like the two survivors being like i love you and i'm just like okay <laughs> yeah but like remember <laughs> when he almost left you to dry remember that like yeah i honestly. wouldn't forget that that's they're in the honeymoon phase for like a day you know like he's woken yeah. up she's like oh you're not dead yay and then i feel like if there was an epilogue, she'd be like, hey, you almost let them have me. What the hell? You know? And then she'd be like, goodbye. <laughs> like, I did like, though, that um, he was an unusual male character from the time, right? Mm -hmm. Like, unusual from all the men that she'd hung out with before, who were all, like, partiers and, like, kind of, like, confident and egotistical. And he's just kind of this, like, shy, like, kind of weak-willed guy mm -hmm. who probably wouldn't have left. So they complimented each other mm -hmm. in this way where she was, she's stubborn and she's ambitious and he's um, grounded and, um, like, kind of happy to stay where he is. An and she was drawn to him because he was so different from the men that she'd known before. And so while I agree with Nikki that I am also kind of getting tired of, like, the pair of the spares, like, you know... <laughs> Yeah, put the two together at the end it still kind of worked for me because I I liked their relationship like I, I liked their dynamic mm -hmm. I I think I couldn't let go of her evil kind of no well yeah I can't let go of evil Francis <laughs> but <laughs> but I also couldn't let go of like shitty Naomi or Noemi in that either because she was like oh, look at this little puppy that I'm going to play with to make him do whatever I want. <laughs> and then in the end, she's like, he's the only one here who can, like, help me with anything. So <laughs> I guess so we will just do things together. And I was like, okay. <laughs> That's what I mean. She is definitely spoiled and selfish throughout the book. Yeah. And there was, there was one it. line that I highlighted that I was like, okay, Aren't, isn't this in the 50s? Because it is in the 50s. And she calls, I don't know if it's Virgil or Howard, but she's like, you're a sick fuck. And I was like, this is the 50s. This would not be said. 
I think people talk like that. I think people said the F word, but I don't think people would call people sick fucks in the 50s. I was like, hmm. I don't know enough about language <laughs> development to, to, to say, but it does that sound like a very thing. modern thing yes. to have been said. Yeah, that one line, I was like, what? That took me out of it. And then I was like, okay, ignore mm-hmm. it because I don't like that. Like, you can say the other things that were happening, you know, fungus, great, all this stuff, cool. But <laughs> <laughs> that line, I was like, mm, questionable. But an anachronistic dialogue choice? Yes. Fact checker? <laughs> like, do we have a fact checker? <laughs> okay, can we talk about when Florence finally died? I was like, this bitch, oh my god. She reminded me of the woman in Rebecca, the housekeeper yeah, lady. Yeah, very much. Oh, yeah. I don't know her name, but I was like, this freaking bitch. Like, oh, I knew that. I mean, hello. It was obvious that the wine was not kosher, you know, Um, (laughs) because she kept mentioning how (laughs) sickly sweet it was, you know, Mm -hmm. and I was like, okay, they're poisoning you. They're poisoning Catalina. They are, you know, just everything is tainted. Like, I don't trust anyone. (laughs) And with Nikki saying, like, I'm going back to Francis for a sec. I'm sorry. (laughs) This tequila has hit (laughs) me. Um, <laughs> at the end, I did think there was going to be like a carry moment, like her hand comes out of the grave, you know, I thought oh, Francis yeah, was going to wake up and be evil or like be Howard or something, you know, I was terrified because I was like, I don't trust anybody, <laughs> Like, <laughs> but I am glad that it worked out. But back to Florence, this friggin' bitch from day one, you know, and I will, I will give it to her. If you have a guest over and they blatantly disregard your rules of smoking in the house, yeah, that's a little rude. But she was a rude bitch, okay? Holy. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I don't know what else there is to say. (laughs) Yeah, you covered the bases. (laughs) Can I get an amen up in here? (laughs) Amen. (laughs) Yeah, Florence sucked. And I'm trying to think of something else to say about Florence, but she she was just shitty, honestly. Yeah, there was really no moment of sympathy no. for Florence. There was no redeeming she was so quality. Ingrained. Okay, yeah. who was she? How was she related to Howard? She was Howard's um, brother's daughter. Wife. So her father was... No, daughter. Mm-hmm. Because she, she went out and younger. found her husband. Yeah. Away. So Howard oh, yes. and Leland were the two brothers. And Howard had Virgil and Ruth. And then Leland had Michael and Florence. And then Florence had um, Francis. And how did Michael... So oh, okay. Francis and Virgil. Virgil is Francis's uncle. Howard is Francis's great uncle. It took me forever to figure this out. I mean, yeah, I still, I'm, I'm still like, I don't know how any of these people are family. I just know they are. They're all honestly yeah. that siblings was... at this point with all the incest. Like, <laughs> well, that's true. There's a lot of incest. Yeah. When she said there was like a particular Doyle look, I was like, okay, incest, incest, incest. Like, yep. Uh, oh, great. Oh my god. There's Kay, so also, like much. Ruth shooting everybody and then Howard making her shoot herself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What? Shuck. I'm that, shook. Yeah, and also I like, like, I was Ruth like really excited it. to hear about all of that. That was the most mm-hmm. compelling part of the story for me. I love yeah. a good like <laughs> murder spree <laughs> turn paranormal <laughs> situation. In fiction. <laughs> In fiction only i'm such a baby i could never handle that in real life let me just say for everyone listening nikki is a wonderful person she just likes dark books and movies okay but it's because she is such a beautiful bubbly presence herself yeah she's gonna balance it you know oh yeah yeah i'm just i'm just too good so i gotta bring the evil in so that people are blinded by my goodness feels good to be bad doesn't it nikki it does (laughs) It really does. <laughs> Only in books. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I agree. Ruth was really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and she had all these kind of like, she was the original kind of rebel of it all, right? She'd figured out what was, well, she knew what was going on because it was a secret to her, but she didn't want to stand for it, right? And she fell in love with someone, I think a mine worker, 
Um, yeah. Outside of the family, she wanted to like have her happy ending, have her true story. And then Howard and the fungus wouldn't let her. So she was like, well, I'm just going to have to end everything for everyone then, I guess. And he was not an English mine worker. He wasn't no, brought he was from Mexican. England. He was Mexican, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I really wish that there would have been more about that and also more about Agnes and Alice. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like there could be some extra novellas or something that would focus on some of those other characters. Yeah, I was really more interested in, like, the paranormal aspects Mm -hmm. of the story or, like, the historical, like, family aspects than the, what the story ended up being about, essentially. But, yeah, I just, I wanted to hear about some, like, crazy ladies and, like, cool ladies and badass ladies. And we didn't get enough of that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we had a couple. Catalina really pulled it out at the end there. Yeah. Yeah, that was a surprise to me. I was like, what? But I guess that was the point. But um, I think the reason why only women were the real revolters in this novel is because, I mean, first of all, look at history (laughs) and how women are treated. But also, I feel like the men were just so quick to be like, yeah, I'm on board with this because it's like you know, let me be the master of my domain. Yeah, the women were the only ones who actually had anything to lose. Like, their babies were being taken from them and, like, eaten and, I don't know, like, other crazy shit. (laughs) Sacrifice to feed the mold (laughs) and stuff. Yeah, I found the baby eating a lot. And then they, like, threw someone in a pit and she was alive? That was Agnes, that was Agnes? yeah, okay. at the very end. Yeah. The image of her in the mushrooms, I must say, I was like, whoa. And yeah. that's what really, I was like, Terrifying. McKenna, McKenna, McKenna. Wow, like, you need to read this. Um, But I think that part especially will lend itself really well to a TV adaptation Oh, and yeah, I so hope, much visual imagery. Yes, I hope they do practical effects and not a lot of CGI. Because yeah, I same. think, yes, I think that would look so killer. Like, oh my and god. And every, everything in the book lends itself to practical effects, really. There's not a whole, like, really, that I can think of off the top of my head, any moments where I'm like, no, you'd have to CGI that. Mm-hmm. I definitely think I would enjoy the story a lot more as a TV series than as Mm -hmm. a book. Mm -hmm. Just because I think that the atmosphere of the show would be, like, so good. If they get it right, there's always Mm -hmm. that chance, but. Yeah, I can see it working really well for sure, though. We are going to move along into our favorite parts and quotes from the book. Why don't we get Tilly to start? Sure. I actually have two little quotes to read. One of them is uh, funny and one of them is atmosphere. So which one do you want to start with? Let's go with atmospheric. No, (laughs) funny. Funny. Okay, great. (laughs) Funny. So this line made me laugh out loud. It's right near the end of the book after everything's kind of come out and Noemi and Francis are talking. And he's telling her about the, or no, I think it's Virgil is talking to her, actually telling her about the plan to marry her off to Francis. And Virgil says, my father can officiate. He's done so before. And Noemi says, so I'll be wed in the church of the holy incestuous mushroom. I doubt that's valid. And I was like, <laughs> holy crap. That's so funny. And also it reminded me of the Neil Gaiman short story at the end of Neverwhere about yes. like, how the Marquis got his coat back yeah. and the mushroom people and how they like worship the mushroom. I was like, wait a minute. Did Neil Gaiman inspire this book? I don't know. <laughs> oh, I love that. Not that, but like <laughs> the tie-in. <laughs> yeah. It's all coming together. It's all a network. It's a link. We're linking things together. <laughs> Literature, the canon. Yeah, all that. What's your second one? Oh, okay. It's quite early in the book, and it was just a really great example of, like, the atmosphere. So Noemi is kind of describing El Triunfo and the high place and kind of how everything is looking in the landscape. And so she says, it didn't look at all like the mountains from her childhood storybooks, where the trees appeared lovely and the flowers grew out by the road. It didn't resemble the enchanting place Catalina had said she would live in. Like the old car that had picked Noemi up, the town clung to the dregs of splendor. 
Ooh, that mm. sounds like a quote from like the great Gatsby or something. Yeah. It gives me really similar like, feelings. Like when he's describing like Dr. Eckelberg's um, mm-hmm. big poster billboard and like the area around there and stuff. I like that a lot. Yeah. That's great. Kelly. Yeah. Okay. I also have two. Cause one is literally four words and it's funny <laughs> or to me it was. Okay, my first little tiny quote is from chapter 8, and she's talking to, yes, she's talking to Virgil, and (laughs) she says to Virgil, you're rude, and he says, I doubt it, and I just went, oh my fucking god. (laughs) I love that, that's so funny. (laughs) I doubt it. You're rude, I doubt it. (laughs) You are rude, okay. (laughs) Okay. That gives me, like, vibes. I can't pinpoint what vibes they are, but I'm getting them, and I like it. It's like, it's like You're still just picturing Bill, aren't you? It's yeah. totally, like, big dick energy. You know what I mean? He's like, mm, right? I doubt it. Like, are you serious? That's why I like worst. it. Ugh. I hate him. But anyways. <laughs> My second quote is <laughs> not funny at all. It oh. is quite the opposite, but I just thought it was a really... Um, Really well written. A very good metaphor. And it is in chapter 22. So it's near the end of the book. And again, she is speaking to Virgil. He's talking to Noemi about his first wife. And she's like, you never really talk about her. Like, did you not even care about her? And he's like, no, but she was inadequate. So like, I can't really say that I miss her. And she's like, wow, how charming. And he says, you won't make me feel bad about that, Noemi. The strong survive, the weak are left behind. I think you're quite strong, he said. And what a pretty face you have. Dark skin, dark eyes, such a novelty. Dark meat, she thought. Nothing but meat. She was the equivalent of a cut of beef inspected by the butcher and wrapped up in waxed paper. An exotic little something to stir the loins and make the mouth water. Ugh. Ugh. Just Yuck. disgusting, yeah. yeah. But again, I thought the writer was quite excellent at her job, you know? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a really good passage. Thanks. <laughs> Sylvia. <laughs> okay, so now that we've said our favorite quotes and parts from the book, we're going to wrap it up here. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the BYOB podcast. If you enjoyed this and want to hear more from us, you can head over to our social media accounts to keep up to date on all things BYOB. Stay tuned after this to hear the first line of our next read, The Poppy War by R.F. Kuang, an epic historical military fantasy inspired by the bloody history of China's 20th century. See you next time, and until then, keep on drinking in great stories. Cheers! Next time on BYOB, the Bring Your Own Book Podcast. Take your clothes off.